The Mom Hour is brought to you by partners like The Essential Calendar. The Essential Calendar makes beautiful, minimalist, poster-sized calendars that show an entire season at a glance so you can see and plan for the big picture. If you're looking ahead to 2024 and have big plans you want to see all in one place, visit theessentialcalendar.com slash themomhour. You'll save 10% off your purchase when you visit that link or when you use our code themomhour at checkout. Again, that's 10% off our favorite seasonal calendars at theessentialcalendar.com slash themomhour. Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm a mom of three kids, ages two, five, and seven, and I live in Southern California. And I'm Megan. I am the mom of five kids, ages six through 17, and I live in Michigan. This is the Mom Hour, part of the Life Listened Network. Hey everyone, and welcome to episode seven of The Mom Hour. I'm Sarah Powers, and I'm here with Megan Francis. Hey, Megan. Hey, Sarah. Nice talking to you. You too. So today we are going to be talking about, um, we're going to be addressing something we got as a question from a listener, and that is um, adding a new baby to your family, or when are you done having babies? We are welcoming our longtime sponsor, Prep Dish, back to the show today. And listeners, if you're looking to boost your protein intake, Prep Dish is making it so easy right now. When you sign up in January, you'll get access to a month's worth of the new Prep Dish Protein Boost meal plans. I love this, Sarah. Protein is so important for our health. It helps support mental clarity, sleep, energy, hormone balance, and more. And as busy moms, we're often not getting enough protein, especially at breakfast. With these meal plans from Prep Dish, you'll learn how to quickly prep four protein-rich dinners and one breakfast. Right. And like all Prep Dish meal plans, they make it so simple to shop once, prep for the week ahead of time, and save time on busy weeknights by having your meals ready to heat and serve. And Megan, these meals sound so delicious and perfect for January. Listen to this. Slow cooker carnitas bowls, stuffed pepper soup, and then there's a Swiss chard mushroom and goat cheese frittata for breakfast. Okay, I am adding that stuffed pepper soup to my rotation ASAP. This is a limited time offer, so make sure to sign up before the end of January to get your free bonus meal plans. To learn more and sign up now, visit prepdish.com slash the mom hour. Again, that's prepdish.com slash the mom hour for a month's worth of the new prep dish protein boost meal plans. Check it out. Sarah, you know, when someone's trying to sell me something, I can be pretty skeptical. Maybe it's my rebel tendencies. But having some healthy doubts has definitely kept me from wasting money on every cool product the algorithm sends my way. You know what's not too good to be true, though? Our sponsor, Ritual, and their clinically backed Essential for Women 18 Plus multivitamin. Yeah, Megan, that's so true. We both love these vitamins because they're made with high quality and traceable key ingredients in clean, bioavailable forms. And they're gentle on an empty stomach with a fresh minty essence in every bottle. So you don't have to worry about nausea if you're a bit relaxed about when you take them. I'm also a big fan of Ritual's sustainability standards. They use scientific tools to select lower carbon packaging, prioritize sustainably sourced ingredients, and set ambitious climate goals. No more shady business. Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus is a multivitamin you can actually trust. Get 20% off your first month for a limited time at ritual.com slash the mom hour. Start ritual or add essential for women 18 plus to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash the mom hour for 20% off. Okay. So before we launch in, I have to say this is real life. We are real moms and I have one real child who is home sick today. So I'm saying that at the top of the show on the off yeah. chance that we have like a little guest visitor wander in with an iPad in the next, you know, 45 minutes to an hour, then we will just yes. roll with that. And you all listening out there have all had sick kids at home, I'm sure. And so I have little... five real children who are just on summer break and don't have anywhere to go today, plus a nephew. But my husband <laughs> nice. is corralling them in the other room, so I'm confident oh, they won't really break impressive. through. You never that's know, though. Impressive. You never okay. know. This Let's is real just, life, people. Yeah, exactly. We can expect there will be an interruption. And if there's not, all the better. Yep. Um, so thank you guys so much for the feedback we've been getting. Um, if you're new to the show or just started listening last week, we asked for um, some of you to email us. And we've been getting some great feedback. So go ahead great and listen feedback. to episode six if you haven't. And uh, you'll, you'll know when you listen that there's a little freebie in it for you if you listen and shoot us an email. So maybe we're just gluttons for feedback. I don't know, but well, we've been loving you know, because your emails sometimes it and feels, it really helps. Yeah. 
It feels like you're just kind of throwing yourself out into the ether. I mean, this this format is so fun, yes. but it's not interactive in the same way social media is or a blog is. And right. so it's so we've been getting so many nice emails from people who are and we love them. Every they keep using the word one. hooked. They're hooked on the show, which <laughs> makes me just so that don't you feel like that word just keeps yes. coming up? And the other thing yeah. that keeps coming up is people saying thank you for making me feel like I don't have to be perfect or that, yes. that you guys are real moms. And that's like, that is so flattering because you and I kind of laugh at ourselves and, you know, we want this show to be about being a better mom, but without making you feel worse about where you are right now. So there's a little yes. bit of both, Absolutely. you know, and I think that was a common theme too, is like, thank you guys for keeping it real. So we will continue to keep it real. Oh yeah. Starting with this next <laughs> little segment, which is, um, a moment of our week from Instagram, which Megan, uh, this might top them all. You have an Instagram from this last <laughs> week. Uh, go ahead, listeners, and look her up at Megan Francis on Instagram, and you shall see the hot pink suspenders. Please discuss, Megan. Okay. Well, this and it's funny. Both of our our picks for the week really fit the the um, topic for the week, <laughs> and the reason mine fits is because I will say that now that I'm kind of out of the baby stage, um, mm -hmm. beyond baby, as I like to put it, I'm. First of all, kind of like, and, and if anybody's not already listening to the Style Hour with uh, Shana Dragellis and I, you oh, should be listening to do. that show oh, as well. It's do. very funny. She's a style blogger. Um, I am not. And <laughs> I'm not even particularly stylish. So the conversations are hilarious because I'll ask her questions or, you know, she'll try to convince me to try something. And it's it's very funny. And she knows what she's talking about. And I, I read a lot of magazines, but I don't really know what I'm talking about. But anyway. Oh, it's great. You two are my favorite. And I can say that. I know I'm kind of like in the podcasting bias, inner circle, but, yeah. but I would be listening anyway. It's awesome. So one of the things I've been trying to do lately is take some more risks with what I wear and not always kind of sticking to the same old, you know, kind of outfit uniform I've been wearing for the last 10, 15, you know, going on. 18 years of motherhood. Oh my goodness. Um, also my husband and I have made it a, a vow, I guess that this is going to be a year we see lots of concerts because it's something we just stopped doing when we had kids. We went to a lot of concerts when we were in college and then we had kids and we completely stopped. Um, and so this year we've been going to lots of shows. We're about 90 miles from Chicago. So there's lots of venues there and we've, we'll find some kind of little up and coming act that, you know, we don't, know who they are really, or maybe we've heard a few of their songs on Spotify and like them and we'll go get a cheap ticket and go. And so we've been doing this a lot lately. Um, and we went to see this group last week or not even last week, a few days ago. Oh my goodness. It's already summer. Like I'm already <laughs> know, in that summer. Already have no idea what time it is or day it is. Um, it was a few days ago and we saw this group called Purity Ring. So we already knew right away this was going to be, everyone there was going to be like 10 to 15 years younger than us. I mean, it was just kind of obvious. This was not <laughs> like our scene exactly. And we went with a friend of mine. Well, so our friend Lisa, who lives in Chicago, she and I went to Target, and I was picking out clothes, and she, I got a jumper. It was my or a romper. I've been talking oh, nice. about getting a romper, and I bought one at Target. It's really cute. It's just black. It's got like a um, I don't even know what, what the length pedal pusher length, I guess, but it's the cuff. You know, it's got yes. the cuff. Yes, and it's like I, that I jogger style. I actually didn't know that it was a romper jumper in that picture. For some reason, I just thought it was like black, a black top and black pants. I like it even more now. Yeah. I was distracted so, by the hot pink system. You were distracted. So <laughs> so my friend Lisa picked out this from the boys' department. She's very small, so she can do this. A shirt with like a dinosaur on the front, like a hot, like a uh, bright neon green dinosaur. And so she <laughs> has this on at home and puts a skirt on with it. And for some reason, it just totally worked. It was hilarious. Like she looked so fun. And I thought I was cute in my romper, but just felt too adult. Like oh. next to her, I felt like... um. A little too like going to a nice restaurant right. look. Like you were not like... fashionable, but not 10 years younger fashionable or exactly. concert. Attire. Right. And it just yeah. wasn't a concert thing. So I went into her closet. She's like, we'll borrow a belt. And I went into her closet and she had these joke suspenders that my brother wore to our Halloween party when he was Steve Urkel. Nice. Um, nice. <laughs> so somehow she'd ended up taking him home. I don't know. This long story. Anyway. I saw him and I was like, that's it. I'm wearing those suspenders. And I put them, I, at first it was a joke, but I walked out and I thought, I have oh, to ask, kind of were awesome. There, were there any pre-party cocktails involved in this wardrobe yes, selection? There were, there were some pre-party cocktails, yes. I'm not sure not I would have otherwise. It makes any difference either courage. way. I'm just curious. Yes, yes. That was definitely part of it. Um, and I walked out in these suspenders and... So my husband's there and Lisa's, they're just cracking up, but they're like, you kind of look awesome. And they're like, you need to wear those. So I took some selfies 
and yeah. then posted them just for a little support. You know, I had to get some support from the internets. Nice. And people were just cracking up and like, yeah, where am I not? And so I did. And I have to say, um, I thought I looked pretty cool. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I looked like a total goofball. It looked very 90s to me, but the 90s are back. Yes. You know. And I think you um, and Gina have talked sometimes about like when you're going somewhere, you talked about when you go to Vegas or when you go somewhere where you don't really know a lot of people and it's not your usual vibe, it's a great time to try out a new look because who yeah, cares? Yeah, because I don't like, know anybody 22 there. 22-year-olds are not probably looking at your outfit. They really. don't care. They don't and care. First of all, a lot of them were dressed outlandishly too. So it wasn't right. like... You know, I just, it didn't, I don't feel like I stood, uh, stood out at all. I felt like I totally was just, right. it was right for the venue. Um, it totally worked. It was really fun. So that's, it. that's mine for the week. So, so <laughs> listeners, we will put the um, photo in the show notes at themomhour.com, but go ahead and follow at Megan Francis because you may get little treats like hot pink suspenders in your Instagram feed. It was I awesome. I love the it. expression on your face too. In one of the pictures you're like cracking. The one we're laughing. I know. <laughs> I love so it. how about yours for the week, which also fits our, um, which also fits our theme and it's you holding oh, a newborn baby, which baby is not your who own, is not, who is not my own. Um, yeah. So there's a picture of me from last weekend. Um, I went up to Santa Barbara where my family lives and I have a very close friend I grew up with who has moved back there, had left for several years like people do and has moved back to our hometown. And she just had her second baby, um, the baby's six weeks, which six weeks is like, that's even almost better than a newborn because they start oh, like so. looking around and yeah, they just become more of a little person. They're rounder, you know, like mm-hmm. they're still totally tiny, but they're like, like loaf of bread and not quite yes. as delicate. So, um, so in the caption, um, I said, cause we, I had been out the night before at a wedding with my family, with none of my children. So I said that the best hangover cure is holding a squishy baby. And then I had to add weight, except not when it's your own baby. Then, <laughs> right. Then you have to take care of them. The worst thing ever. And you're up at five in the morning if you've been out the night before. So I realized I had the best of both worlds, which is I got to get up, have a cup of coffee, eat a giant breakfast burrito, and then go hold. <laughs> A baby. Um, That's awesome. So, yes, we did think it was fitting since we're going to be talking about being done having babies in this episode. And I am definitely done having babies, but it but is you really feel fun. Like, do you feel like now when you hold a baby, like I used to, you know, 10 years ago and I was still kind of in the prime mm-hmm. having babies, I felt like when I would hold a newborn, I would get this like, oh, you know, like, am I going to have another one soon? Like I would right. have this urge, like I would want one. And it doesn't happen to me anymore. I really enjoy them, but I just enjoy them for themselves and that's yes it. and I you know what I find is I find that um I understand like the old ladies who like you barely know who ask to hold your baby because there is when I see a baby I really do have the desire to hold and the the snuggling right. with the baby but I it's been two and a half years since my last baby and I still really have never had the desire where I'm like where I feel that way, like, oh, maybe I want my own. And we're going to talk about this like a whole lot, like feeling done and being done. But for me, it's more of like just the desire, like, can I hold your baby even if I don't know you? And yeah. that I totally can see. I can see how the crazy old ladies who come up and like want to touch your baby and you're like, who are you? Like, I can understand now because if you're not, if you don't get to hold one every day, it's right. that just like, oh, can I just, or the people at a party. I just remember this when my babies were little, the people would be like, if you need help, I'll hold the baby. And I like, I'm like, thanks, but I, we've like met twice. Like I, you're probably not <laughs> who I would seek out to hear to hold my baby. But now I get it because I, I get that desire to hold them. But I really since having my third have not ever held one and thought I want to do this again, but no. that is something we're going to talk about because I think everybody's a little different there. So awesome. Well, let's get um, into it then. Let's do it. Let's do it. So let me read our reader, our listener. I keep saying reader question, our listener question, which comes from Jackie and she emailed, um, anybody is welcome to email us. Hello at the mom hour.com with a show idea. So this is the first time we're featuring a listener question as our show topic and please keep sending them. We love them. Um, so this is what Jackie wrote. Um, she said, I would like to talk about third babies. I'm contemplating having one more. It's pretty unusual in my area and social circles. So I don't have a lot of people to ask what surprised you about having a third baby. Are there things I should know? So Megan, you have a third, fourth and fifth baby. I have a third baby, but I thought we could start by answering Jackie's question as 
as specifically as possible to maybe both talking about our decision to have a third baby and how that adjustment going from two to three was. But then, mm -hmm. of course, this is going to broaden into a much bigger discussion because you went on to have two more and I'm definitely done at three. And we'll kind of talk about that whole process of being done. But yeah. first, do you want to just tell, tell us about your when you had baby number three, what was that decision like and what um, what was that adjustment like going from two to three? Well, I will say that that specific pregnancy was sort of a non-decision. Um, okay. However, I always knew that I would probably end up having at least three, probably. You know, I, I, nice. I came from a big family. Four or five kids was the number I sort of had in my head. Um, then I got to, interestingly, I got to two and was like, meh, I don't know, maybe I'm done. And I'm sure I would have eventually ended up having a third anyway, but William was not, like, planned exactly. Yeah. So, um so what it surprised me, the, the biggest thing that surprised me was that everyone kept saying, like, I would get two reactions. Some people would say, well, from people who actually had three or more kids, people who right. had fewer than three thought it was nuts. But people who had three or more would either say, third babies are so easy, they just fit in, you're going to love it. Mm -hmm. Or they would say, this is when you're going to become outnumbered mm -hmm. and it's going to be, you yeah, know, you lose not your terrible, man -to -man but defense. exactly. It's like everyone's favorite analogy. Yeah. Right. Um, and I will say both of those things were true. I did, it was the parenting moment where I threw up my hands mm -hmm. on a lot of stuff. Like, and how old, can you remind us, how old were your two boys? When yeah, you were, they were four born. and six when okay. William was born. Um, and I think it was like the moment where I just decided, okay, it's not worth it to take them all mm -hmm. to a restaurant, for example. Mm -hmm. Or I'm not cloth diapering this time around because right. I don't want to. Right. <laughs> I mean, there was just a lot of things I sort of threw my hands up about. And I think that having the third made me a much happier mom in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. It was kind of a point for me where I let go of so many of mm -hmm. the standards I created for myself with the first two. And just that I, what is the point? Why am I doing this? Like, what do right. I feel like? What are the essentials that really I need to, you know, to mm -hmm. look to, to have a happy family and raise good kids. And, and that's what I really focused on. And I, I also stopped caring as much what other people thought because mm -hmm. I, realized how much it didn't matter. And, mm -hmm. and my, as my other kids were also getting older at the time, so that kind of helped. Um, that said, all of the stuff people said about third babies in my experience was also true. William was easygoing. Mm -hmm. He was the only the first of my babies that I could just lay there. Like I could just lay him on my bed on his back and mm -hmm. sit next to him and read or whatever. Mm -hmm. And he would just lay there and like look mm -hmm. at his hands. I mean, my other two would have been squirming and crying. Within. Isn't he still pretty sweet and easygoing? He's, Isn't that yes. still kind he's of his personality? Totally still sweet Aww. and easygoing. And he's kind of goofy, but he's just sweet, easygoing, wants to mm -hmm. fit in, you know, wants his brothers to to like him, looks up to mm -hmm. his big brothers and like mm -hmm. is a good big brother to his younger siblings. So um I remember when he was a newborn, he would take five hour naps and I would wake oh him up because I was worried. Right. Like right. something wrong with him. He's sleeping too much. <laughs> Aww. No, I would never do that. But anyway, right. I guess no. So yeah. so both of those things ended up being true. It was tough. Um, it was getting used to having three is tar is hard. But at the same mm -hmm. time, there was something very sweet about it. So I'm kind of curious what your experience was. Yeah, no. I Keeping in your... mind, your kids were closer together too. Yes, and I think that's a big difference. So when um, I also kind of always wanted three, I come from a family of three. And I think before we had kids, I would just say, "Oh, two or three. But when I was pregnant with the second, I had a, this very clear feeling like this is not my last pregnancy. And even mm -hmm. before my husband was totally wasn't that he wasn't on board, but just maybe hadn't thought that far. I mean, we were having our second baby, like we weren't talking about a third. But right after my second child was born, I remember thinking, that's not the last time I'm going to do that. Um, so I was pretty clear. Um, I did think I'd wait longer and have like have them be four and six, like you said. Um, and I just kind of got impatient. I um, I was like, well, I know we want a third. And I, I knew the third would be our last or that I wanted it to be. And I thought, let's just get us all here. I kept saying, I feel like we're not all here yet. And I would like to get us all here so we can move on. And I, I, that right. kind of sounds like callous, but just maybe the way my mind works, I was like, let's just get it over with, which is like, right. No, I like think that that makes a lot of an sense. unromantic way to talk about pregnancy. So the age difference between my number two and my number three is just over two and a half years. So it's two years. And then they were like two and a half and four and a half when Violet was born. And that I do think makes a big difference in just how able and independent your older kids are when adding a third. Um, 
so I think it was, um, it was hard for me, but I've talked to so many people that like you say, the third is the easiest, they go with the flow. So I may be in the minority. And of course I wanted and still want all three of my children. But um, I think that age different, the closeness in age and my third child is my most active, challenging, spirited child and was mm -hmm. from the beginning, like the worst sleeper, the hardest pregnancy the busiest toddler, you know, and she is as wonderful as she is difficult. But if you, right. you know, if I had a super, super easygoing third kid, I might be singing a different tune. So, right. Yeah. yeah. It's so, all very individual. So it's interesting. So I guess I think what surprised me, one of Jackie's questions was what surprised you about having a third. And I think for me is how many times I've had to relearn that lesson that all kids are so different because as much different as my first two are, um, they have a lot in common in, in their temperaments. Um, mm -hmm. they have a lot different, but I've been able to parent them largely the same way, especially as toddlers. Um, neither of them were super bouncing off the walls, physically active, like, you know, throw yourself off the nearest ledge because it's fun type of kids. And <laughs> yeah. I, and I think I got lucky because so many kids, you know, have just those super, you know, physically active kids and, and neither of my first two was. So like, I feel like I'm learning, I'm like school of hard knocks stuff mm -hmm. with my third kid. So I think that's one thing that if, if something surprised me, it's that, yeah, they really are so different. And my third is like a different breed altogether than my first two. So it's keeping well, that's, me, keeping that's me interesting. <laughs> so it's like, I think sometimes you're the personalities you get with the first one or two or, you know, the first one is so influential about the way you feel about the net, the subsequent kids, right. because my first uh, Jacob was very, um, you know, he, he cried and stuff. He needed to be held. It wasn't like he was, he wasn't as chill as William. Right. But he was an easy baby. He yes. was a kid you could just strap on and take anywhere and we would take him to restaurants and he would just sit there and, you know, bang stuff on his high chair tray and look around and, and right. he was just mellow and a very mellow and easy toddler. And so he was a toddler. He wasn't quite two when Isaac was born. And Isaac from the moment he was born was a screamer mm -hmm. and, uh, hard. He was just mm -hmm. a really hard baby. Um, cried a lot, a lot, a lot. Mm -hmm. When he became a toddler, he was that kid who ran away mm -hmm. in the store. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember him going under, I don't know if we have to put some, I have to say this because it's so funny, but I'm just letting <laughs> you know, I'm good about to say a cuss word. So if you have some little kids in the room, take them yes. out. I'll never forget one time him climbing under the racks at Target and we couldn't see where he was. Yes. And he was like two and he was just going, shit, <laughs> shit. And we're like, oh my gosh, where is he? Where is he? Make him stop. But we couldn't find him. I mean, it was, and then now looking back, it's so funny. And he knew he was doing it. He was a stinker. He knew he wasn't supposed to say that word. That and, is, just, and he knew we couldn't find him. That so is, That's awesome. Now that's he's that. the most mellow of my kids, to be honest. He's like super mellow. But he was, he went through a phase. Um, so when I finally had William, just by comparison, right? he was so easy. Right. And then Owen was kind of hard in a lot of the ways Isaac Owen was. Owen was a have... screamer too, right? I Owen remember. was a screamer and had yeah. that terrible sleeper and had night terrors and just, he wasn't hard. His disposition wasn't um, quite as <laughs> naughty, I guess. Uh -huh. I love the word naughty because I feel like for little kids like that who are, yeah. you know a naughty kid when you see one. Yeah, we, we, know, we know what you mean. Like, yes, right. that is a yeah. perfect, yeah. Um, Owen wasn't like that, but he was hard, but. But I guess by that point, because I just had so much experience, I was kind of like, oh, okay, you know, this is what right. this is going to be like for a while. Right, right. Um, so That's... yeah, every kid you have, the kid you have before, yes, it influences the way you feel about that. So it's, you know, maybe it's not a third baby thing. Maybe it's just right. who that person is. Yeah. Well, and how close but... together they are. And before we move on and broaden from Jackie's question, I'm just curious, do you feel like th just as a number of size of family, because you've said on this show before that you count like three or more as sort of like the larger family. Do you feel like mm -hmm. there is a little bit of a shift in what you can do and how people perceive you in three versus two kids? I mean, I, oh, yeah. I kind of, I kind of do. I feel like there's like a status quo maybe seems like two and it depends on where you live, yeah. but um, that three definitely puts you into kind of a different category of just how you operate in the world. It's it surprised me. Three kids was when I felt like I jumped the shark to a lot of people. Like they <laughs> thought and they just couldn't and I was like three. I remember thinking three kids, like big deal, you know? It doesn't it didn't feel like a like a large family to me, right. but people would see me out especially cuz they were all younger. I think that makes a big difference. When they're spread out, it's not as 
People right. don't look at you with that same visceral, like, oh, you know, better you than me. That was when right. I started getting comments like that. Right. Um, I think so culturally, for sure. Mm-hmm. The things I think it changed for us, um, like in a practical sense, were, again, a lot of kind of cultural norms now that are different than they would have been. So, um, you know, if you want all your kids to have their own bedrooms, if that's right. important to you, yeah, you've got to get a four-bedroom house. Yeah, we started room sharing with, the, with yeah. the third. Yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. Yeah, and I remember my um, sister-in-law and brother, I remember some of their family members kind of like giving them a hard time because they had uh, two kids sharing a bedroom, and they were tiny little kids. But, like, that was that's not seen now in some ways as w- how things are done. It's like a big right. deal when kids share right. a room, which I think is so funny because right. – when I, when we were kids, people lived in tiny little houses. Yeah. I mean, you see these little houses, yeah. people lived their whole lives and it had large yeah. families and it just yeah. wasn't, you just get creative and it's not a big deal. Um, cars, you mm-hmm. know, now that car seats are so ungodly big, yes, it affects the kind of vehicle you can drive. Yep. You know, you're kind of stuck with either an SUV or a, um, a minivan if you've yep. got three kids in car seats. They're yep. bulky. Yep. So stuff like that, practically speaking, it, and it does affect, you know, it's kind of easy to find. I found um, it was really easy to find sibling groups mm-hmm. that Jacob and Isaac could like mm-hmm. play with together because they were two years apart, and it was really right. easy to arrange play dates, yes. you know, group play dates. Add a third kid, and that totally throws that off. I totally agree. That's nobody something... wants your third kid. <laughs> well, that's something we've experienced since we moved here to Southern California about a year ago. Um, it, we moved from Arizona and Arizona is very affordable and has a lot of young families. So having three was not out of the norm there, right. nor was my age. I, I, I didn't start super young, but I'm 35 and I'm done having three kids. So mm-hmm. we moved to Southern California and many families just, just generalizing, not everybody, but many, many families didn't start having kids till 35 and are, and just had two. So the play date thing you mentioned is really something I've noticed here. It took a, much longer to find people, you know, same thing, my older two having kind of sibling pairs that match up. And then I have this crazy toddler always there right. who just can't like do everything, you know, or we've got to be home for a nap or things that like just don't apply to other families. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, oh, I had something else when you were talking about it's, it's gone. It's Another gone logistical now. factor of um, <laughs> adding, of adding the third, but um, it's gone now. So well, I Jackie, feel like those are, those are mostly things that you get used to, you know, yeah, and you just oh, figure definitely. out a way to deal with them. And it's kind of a bummer when you can't do a tradesy with another right. family because right. they don't have a kid that fits one of your right. kids, yeah, but no, you find ways like around it. It's a deal breaker. Oh, I remember right. it. And it, that is babysitters. Babysitters oh, is another yes. functional one where it's, it's just not a big deal to find a high school or a college kid or a family friend or a family member who can put your two kids to bed, read them a book and put them to bed. And I feel like that changed a lot when I had a third kid. And because of yeah. the eight, because then they had a, an infant and say they were three and five by then, you know, that's still, they're all p- still pretty young. They need help getting their pajamas on and going mm-hmm. to the bathroom. And so I feel like the list of people who could babysit all three kids like went from like, you know, pretty long to like my mom. Yeah. <laughs> like, yes, absolutely. For a long time. And we now, and we're now finally out of that, like two and a half years later, like I have no problem if it's a well-recommended babysitter or a neighbor friend, you know, being like, here, here's my three kids for a couple of hours. But it took right. two and a half years to get there. So I do think that's, that is another kind of functional difference between two and three, yeah. depending on your yeah. sitter availability and your comfort with <laughs> handing your children over to strangers. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> awesome. Oh, and so- okay, one other, one other logistical thing. This is so funny that I remember um, being a – I guess a bigger deal was when you have, when two of them are really little, see that didn't happen with me with my first three, but right. it ended up happening when I had like the middle three, I guess, cause Owen mm-hmm. and Will were two years apart. They both needed to be carted. Like they needed to be put mm-hmm. into some kind of a contraption, you know, double stroller or some sort of <laughs> contraption. And then I still had this other kids to deal with, um, who were too big to be carted around anyway. But it's like, again, it just makes that little bit of a difference. It's not mm-hmm. a huge deal. It's just one of those things you don't really think about until you're like, oh my gosh, I'm out walking right. on a city street with right. you know, three little kids and two of them need to be contained. And then the other one, do I make them hold? So I, we did actually right. make them hold on to the um, cart a lot yeah, or the, the stroller or the cart, yeah. like for the grocery yeah. store, you know, I've got two of them in the, like the, yep. in the pretend car thing. Yep. And then the third has to like 
hold under my hand. They, they could put their hand like yeah. on the rail between my hands so they don't take off. So anyway. Yeah. And all of that thing. like sounds so cliche, but all of that passes fairly quickly. It so. does. That's why it's all just coming back to my mind now. You know? Right. Right. Anyway. So Jackie, well, I don't know if we encouraged you <laughs> or scared you. Jackie's reproductive future may or may not rest in this conversation. No, just kidding. Um, I do hope that was kind of helpful and answered Jackie's question. And thank you again. Anybody who has a question for us or a show topic idea, it's hello at themomhour.com. Just to throw that in there again. Or if you just want to say hi. We like when you just say oh, hi. Oh, yeah, too. we love that. Um, so maybe we can kind of just keep going on long the same yeah. topic, but talk about what, um, so three was third and done for me, but not for you. And I know this is a topic that people kind of, everybody has a very unique and personal s- perspective on the idea of being done. Do you want to kind of give us yeah. yours? Well, it's funny because after we had our fourth and our life at that point was changing a lot, we were living in Chicago. And so, um, we were looking at a very a much more expensive <laughs> lifestyle than what we had been used to and less space, you know, and school difficulties. Like um, we're in Chicago, the way the school system works, which we didn't realize till after we were living there in the city of Chicago, it's basically, unless you live in a very nice neighborhood, most people don't send their kids to the neighborhood schools. Most people send their kids to a magnet school or some kind of school of choice. Mm-hmm. And so there's this lottery system that happens like a year in advance. Mm-hmm. Um and you, you try to get your, you know, you try to do selective enrollment, which means the kids have a good enough mm-hmm. grades or test scores or whatever that they get into to your first picks. But if that doesn't work out, then they get in the second. So anyway, it's very complicated. <laughs> and our kids were going to a private school. And I do remember thinking like, this isn't going to work when all four of them are in school. There's no way we can pay for four kids right. to go to private school. Um, so we were kind of like, oh, what are we going to do? And around so around the same time, I just was sort of looking at my kids and, and Owen was two. I think was Owen two. Yeah, he was two. And I thought, I don't know if I'm done. Like, I just wasn't mm-hmm. sure. I mean, if mm-hmm. I had, if you had asked me, do you want more kids? I would have said, no, no, <laughs> I'm done. But when I really thought about it, I just wasn't sure. And I told John something along those lines. I was like, I'm 31 now. If or I, I think it was 30 actually. And I said, if going on 31, I was like, if we're going to have another kid, it needs to happen now because I spent my entire, literally my entire mm-hmm. 20s raising babies, babies. and being yeah. pregnant. And I'm not doing that throughout my thirties. Like it's going to be now or it's not going to happen. And so we're like, okay, let's see what happens. And I got pregnant that month. (laughs) So, I mean, I didn't really like, if you, again, if I went and recorded like rewound the tape to the day we were having that conversation, did I really think I meant it? I mean, like would I say I really meant that I wanted to have another kid or was I just ambivalent? I guess I was just ambivalent, but interesting. it still worked out. And of course, you know, a after the initial like, oh, now we were just thinking how hard it was going to be to do the city with four. Now five, this is going to be impossible. We just made different choices. We ended up moving back to Michigan. And ultimately, it wound up being great on every level, you know. Well, Megan, I've been wearing Vionic shoes for over three years now. But this month, my trusted shoe brand and I entered a new phase of our relationship, international travel. Well, Sarah, that is a serious commitment, <laughs> right? You can't just pack any shoe for a trip abroad. It's got to be stylish enough for those major cosmopolitan cities. It's got to be sturdy enough for trains, planes, buses, and city streets. And obviously, it's got to be comfortable enough to support your feet over many, many miles of walking. Well, no surprise, my Vionics were up to the task. I had two pair with me, a pair of casual sneakers in a cool gray color, and then a weatherproof suede ankle boot that I swear still looks brand new after 10 days on soggy sidewalks. Megan, the only time my feet hurt the entire trip was New Year's Eve when I made the mistake of wearing a pair of booties not from Vionic. So I'll just leave that data right here for you. Okay, well, that's pretty conclusive, Sarah. Vionic has the best curated styles to get you ready for whatever 2024 has in store, whether it's jet setting like Sarah or keeping up with busy mom life on this side of the pond. They even offer a 30 day guarantee, wear them, love them or return them for a full refund within 30 days. And we've got a great deal for you. Use code the mom hour 15 at checkout for 15% off your entire order at vionicshoes.com when you log into your account. That's a one time use only. Bionic shoes, wearable well-being for your feet. Sarah, when my kids were little, I was always pretty torn on whether to give them a daily multivitamin. I knew that modern kids' diets have some pretty big nutritional gaps, but I also knew that most children's vitamins are basically candy in disguise. 
They're filled with sugar. They have all kinds of chemicals and preservatives in them. And I was like, why would I give these to my kids? Luckily, two dads recognized the problem and came up with a solution. Haya, the pediatrician approved, super powered, chewable vitamin. Haya fills in the most common gaps in modern children's diets to provide the full body nourishment our kids need with a yummy taste they love. Formulated with the help of nutritional experts, Haya is pressed with a blend of 12 organic fruits and veggies, then supercharged with 15 essential vitamins and minerals, including vitamin D, B12, C, zinc, folate, and many others to help support immunity, energy, brain function, mood, concentration, teeth, bones, and more. Your first shipment comes with a cute bottle that has fun stickers your kids can use to decorate it too. My kids always loved that. And we've worked out a special deal with Haya for their best-selling children's vitamin. Receive 50% off your first order. To claim this deal, go to HayaHealth.com slash MomHour. This deal is not available on their regular website. Go to H-I-Y-A-H-E-A-L-T-H dot com slash MomHour and get your kids the full body nourishment they need to grow into healthy adults. Did you have that sense when you were pregnant with Clara and after that when she was born? Did you have a pretty steady sense of doneness after that or um yeah or because did it you know, ever honest, kind of go up you know waver again well here's what I realized when I was pregnant with Clara and then after she was born what I realized was that I'll never really get over wanting you know it was it's never easy for me to close doors I don't like closing myself off to options that's like a personality thing for me so that's difficult like I just knowing like that door is closing forever mm-hmm. to me was very painful mm-hmm. um and I love little babies. I love, love, love. And I have very easy pregnancies too. So mm-hmm. there's that. And then I have, you know, I've had easy births. And then I love babies. And mm-hmm. and you were young. even. And I even was young. I could have kept that's going. the other thing is sometimes time, I think, just kind of makes that decision for you. But, you, right. you know, I think you and I were both, were we both 32 when we had our last? Were you 32 when you had Clara? I was almost 32. Yeah. Okay. So, and I was, yeah, I was 32, almost 33. But Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I could have easily mm-hmm. had another kid or two or three. I mean, in in my family, women remain fertile pretty long. So I could have just kept going indefinitely and see how, how many I could squeeze in there. But, um, I think for me, what I finally realized was practice. Like if I kind of took a step back from the emotions of it, that at some point it has to be about how many people I want around the table later, not Mm -hmm. how many babies I want to hold, because Mm -hmm. I'm never going to not want Mm -hmm. to have a baby (laughs) in my life. Like I'll never not have some part of me that longs for that. Um, that said, the longer and further I get away from it, the less sad that makes me. It was such mm-hmm. a big part of my life and my identity for so long. Um, that was hard to give up. But now that I've taken if you know, now that I've had a few years off, mm-hmm. uh, I don't think I would want to go back. So, right. um, was I, see, so that's the thing. So I never really felt done. And I think some people never feel done. Yeah. I, I, I definitely have to know that some people never feel done. And I think there's some people who kind of live in that ambivalence, for a long time until maybe, yeah, I think it's hard until maybe, you know, age or whatever right. kind of just makes the decision for them. Were you, would you say you and John were pretty aligned, you know, about the number or the being done? Cause that, that I think that can be an issue too in some marriages is feel, one person feeling very strongly that there's another one out there and another, and the other yeah. person not. You know, I feel like John, took my lead on that in a lot Mm -hmm. of ways. Like, I feel like he was always somebody who, um, was satisfied with what we had, but also was always open to bringing another person into the mix, you know? Is Um, he one of three? Is that? He's one of three. Yeah. So he was he ever like, whoa, this is a lot of kids. Yeah. Oh, sure. (laughs) He says that every day. No, just kidding. (laughs) No, but I think he also kind of prides himself on being able to handle it, which I think Mm -hmm. is a kind of an ego thing for him. And also I will say like in my family, we, because we have a huge, I have a huge family. I'm going to have, um, all these siblings and each sibling has an average of four kids. So there's like 16 cousins and, and a lot of them are older. And so we're kind of like the family that picks up strays. So we've had two cousins or, you know, a niece and a nephew who wound up living with us at one point or another. Um, we've also had family members of his that have stayed with us for like kind of extended periods of time. So I think we've kind of become the people who are just, ex- we'll just expand to fit people. I love <laughs> to that. Fit more people. That's a good reputation to have. I mean, I, yeah. love, I love that, especially in this day and age when there's just a lot less, there's fewer big families and fewer kind of intergenerational, you know, right. like living situations and yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that I don't think that he ever consciously thought like I would like to have five kids one day. But I think the more used to the just kind of the way I roll, 
Um, <laughs> I think that was, <clears throat> excuse me, more comfortable for him than he would have anticipated. And he just went with it. So it worked out. I mean, it all, you know, that's not to right. say there wasn't some stress for goodness sakes. I have kids, right. but, right. Right. but we dealt. And then he also got really good at being that dad out with all these kids and that is, you know, he does get a little bit of a, an ego boost from that, I think, to be perfectly <laughs> honest. I love that. So, yeah. So what about you? Did you guys have, because you're yeah. both from families of three as well? No, he's one of no. two. And I one think two. I think Brian would have been fine stopping at two. But I think, I, again, I think, like you said, he took my lead. And I was so um, pretty clear after having two that I wanted one more, that it wasn't ever something that we sat up wondering whether it was right. He, I think right. he... The timing was one thing. I think I just said a few minutes ago that I, I thought I'd wait a little bit longer and have them be a little bit older, and then I just got impatient. So I think that being ready to go for number three was, if anything, where I felt ready sooner. And he was like, oh, my gosh, are we like gonna, really going to do this all again? And I was like, yeah, let's just <laughs> get it over with, like I said. So it wasn't a point of conflict, but maybe the, like the closest that there was to maybe not being on the same page was more about the timing, more about the when and not the weather. But um, I, yeah, I do feel kind of fortunate. And this is probably, like you said, it's a personality thing. You don't like that, that finiteness of closing doors. And I, I think I kind of am that way. Like I tend mm. to be 100% in something and then I feel kind of like c- complete or like almost <laughs> yeah. secure in closing right. a door. Um, and I've been that way in other areas of my life. So um, I think I did. I really worried that I wouldn't feel done. It was like a fear that I had earlier in motherhood that like, what if I just want to keep doing this? And that's not practical. And it's not even maybe what I want, but I don't want that sadness or that you're like that longing. Um, when I, after my first and after my second, the, the desire to have another one was a lot about, um, being pregnant. I really liked being pregnant. The third pregnancy was harder, but I loved the anticipation of being pregnant. I love the excitement of telling people you were pregnant and having, you know, having the attention on you in for better or for worse. I mean, that's true. It just feels a little bit special. And I, um, all three times my desire was less about, I, I want another baby to hold and more about, I'm really excited to be pregnant again. And of course I also wanted the baby at the other end of that, but the feelings of excitement, a lot of them were tied up in pregnancy just for whatever reason for me. So I kind of worried that I would always want to be pregnant. Does that m- make sense? Like that oh, yeah, a year or two would pass after, after the third kid and that I would want to be pregnant again. And I really don't. <laughs> and I really, you really feel don't. very, very done. And I, um, I feel lucky that I feel that way. Cause I know it's hard for a lot of people. Um, and they, they know yeah. they don't really want more kids, but that, that longing for a pregnancy or a new baby is just kind of nagging. And I mean, I make a lot of jokes about it cause Violet is such a handful that I make a like I joke that she's like my third and fourth kid rolled into one and that right. she reminds me every day why I don't want any more and there's a lot of truth in it I mean it's fun to joke about but she really has been enough of a challenge just physically and mentally for me that it is very easy not to want to do that again and you know maybe maybe in another year I will feel some of that longing not that it will happen but I have not felt very conflicted. I don't know if that makes sense. And I, that's kind of been a pleasant surprise because I worried that I would. So just... Yeah, no, I think a lot of people can relate to that. And it's interesting what you said about wanting to be pregnant. Um, I'll just put a little plug in. I wrote an ebook about a year ago called Beyond Baby. And it's mm-hmm. about... It's a 40-week workbook. It's, it, it works... You know, it is a workbook um, where you kind of go through your life post-kids. And you don't have, yeah. you don't have to be, you know really old or anything. Right. You don't They're have to literally be beyond baby. You're just moving into a new mindset. Right. And so one of the pieces of feedback I've gotten so many times from moms who either read the book or did, there was an accompanying um, email course that went along with it, was that they had identified so much with that stage of life. And that, you know, I'm not going to say like, for me, I did like being pregnant. I loved knowing I was going to meet this new person. Yes. And that was like, so, and it's, it's like a project. You know me, I love starting new projects <laughs> and, and having a, being pregnant is like the ultimate project, yeah. right? And having this, like, what is it going to turn out like? And it's all yeah. very unknown. It's exciting. Um, so for all those reasons, I also enjoyed being pregnant and the excitement surrounding it. But also if I kind of encapsulate that point, that period of my life, there's just something really magical about being in the childbearing years, mm-hmm. you know, when everyone around you that you're hanging out with, maybe it's very simple in a way. I mean, it's hard, but it's simple because your priorities and your focus and, yeah, are your so purpose, clear. You have a very clear purpose. And you also yes. 
you also get to not make excuses, but you get to like, you have the ultimate, like get out of jail free card for many yeah. years. You really do. Yeah. And you know, some people use it more than others, but really you get to be pretty pure about what your job is and what your focus yeah. is. And I don't mean job inside or outside the home, but I just mean your, you know, your where most of your energy is going. And so, yeah, yeah. sorry, I cut you yeah. off. Yeah. And I feel like when I was really in the thick of that, I almost retreated from the world for a long time. Even when I was working outside the home, it was like I still, I had this little bubble around me and mine, you know, and and my friend circle was sometimes large because I had a lot of different mom friends that I kind of hung out with, but still very, I don't know, just very specific. Like, Mm -hmm. and it just was a period of my life that I'll never have back. And that was hard to give up that identity. Mm -hmm. Um, and that feeling of maybe there's another around the bend and maybe this is going to happen again. Just being in that bubble and, and who you're in the bubble with. And, you know, a lot of the bubble people <laughs> kind of part ways after a while, not purposely or right. anything, but you right. just – everyone leaves the bubble and not everyone stays connected. And it's a known um, – the bubble is a known thing. You know, what's right. on the other side of it is for a lot of people is unknown if they've, yes. you know, scaled back in what's their next? career or like yeah. forgotten to talk to their husband for eight years or whatever. Yeah. It is like – completely a different world, perhaps as yeah. like as big of a life change as some other big ones, like having kids in the first place or right. you know, moving away from your hometown and going to college. I mean, it's a pretty major shift in t- like we, I think you said in the book, like looking up and out, like it's like you yeah. look up from your head, you've been head down in the trenches for so long. So, well, I'm glad you brought up Beyond Baby because um, I remembered a chapter from it that was about this very issue. And um, maybe, I don't know if there's a way I'm putting you on the spot, but maybe there's a way that we could either give away this chapter or link to it or something oh, if people are interested, yeah. then they can buy the book. But um, I know we, we shared some free sample chapters um, at one point, so maybe we could share this one with us. Yeah, maybe listeners. we can just put a link to it in the show notes. Yeah. Um, or um, you can email us for it. Yeah, because there's so much good stuff in this chapter and good kind of journaling prompts that it would be not even enough time to talk about it on the podcast, but maybe you can um, kind of touch on a couple of them. I love you close the chapter with three things that you said, I realize about myself and many women I know. And there's kind of three things to think about. And the first one is, Rarely does anyone regret adding a child to the family. And that's kind of obvious. Like none of us say, oh, I wish I hadn't had that right. kid. But for people on on the fence or wondering if if that that is not is you're never gonna regret probably having that final kid. But your number yeah. two, your follow-up is yet when a woman feels a longing for another baby, she's actually feeling nostalgia for the infancy of her current child. So those two, that number one and number two kind of go together. On the one hand, this is not a decision you're probably going to regret. On the right. other hand, this longing may be sort of misplaced or misidentified. Is that, right. did I kind of explain that right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, <clears throat> I think that especially when you're still in the thick of it um, and you're holding this baby and every day this baby is getting older or this toddler or whoever it is and you're seeing that phase um, go go bye-bye, <laughs> you know, it is nostalgia. And I, I remember having so much nostalgia for that specific baby um, a week earlier, especially when they're little and they're changing really fast. You, you know? see a picture and, I, and you're like, oh my gosh. Oh, I know. Do they I really look like that? I felt like you that? were the same, but they're so yep. different. Yeah. Yep. And I think that when I finally realized that I could continue to have babies for the rest of my life and I would mm-hmm. still never get back right. my babyhood with that, you know, which, right. whichever one I was mourning. Right. Um, and also the other thing that I kind of realized, and this is going to sound like you said earlier, kind of not crass, but um, I kind of realized that like most of the stuff that I really love about having little tiny babies is so fleeting. Again, mm-hmm. it does. I could just do it for the rest mm-hmm. of my life mm-hmm. and I'm never going to be able to hold on to it, you right. know, and it's, it after a while it stopped being, problem. <laughs> it doesn't solve the problem. And after a while it stopped being worth all the other stuff, <laughs> all the right. poop and all the, you yes. know, the, and the postpartum stuff and all that. It, the, the trade-off became to me when I was done, the trade-off didn't work out anymore. Right. Right. Um, it didn't, yeah, it didn't solve the problem. It didn't, it wasn't worth it it wasn't worth it in the end. But of course, I'm so glad I have all of my kids. So that's right. my other thing. It's not like I regret any of them. Right. And for some that... people who are, there's some people I think who focus more on the practical worries, the finances yeah. and the logistics and could be yeah. talking themselves out of a decision that really um, 
you know, may be the right one. So it, right. it can that's go very both true ways. too. Do you know what I and mean? And I will say, yeah. And I will you and say I had to too, like ourselves that we were done, but there's other people right. who might need to listen to that little voice saying, um, you know, my mom, my mom tells the story of my sister is six years younger and eight years younger. So we were eight and six when she was born. And it was very much like kind of trying to convince themselves that they were done and just feeling like, nope, there's another one out there. Yeah. And, you know, yep. So, well, um, and I think that's, that's really, that's a really good point because, um, if you're more, I'm more emotional, but for people who are more logical or practical, um, talking themselves out of it or kind of feeling like there's all these obstacles. And of course there's the old cliche that, you know, if everyone waited for the perfect time to have a baby, nobody would ever have one, which is absolutely true. And, and the other one I will say is I feel like all those practical things, it's not that they, it's not that we, you know, John and I joke sometimes, like, what would our lives be like if we had no kids? We would be living high on the hog. Like we would have so much extra money. I mean, like the travel and all this stuff that we would do. And it's true. I mean, if we had one kid, our life would also be very different. And if we had two, our life would be very different, but it all works out. It's somehow your life makes room and the practical stuff You know, I can't point to one, you know, going from one to two or two to three or three to four and say, oh, that was when, that's when we we really went over the edge. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Or that was, you know, that's when we really stepped in it because that was irresponsible or, and, and because culturally, except for now, I guess, in uh, wealthy communities, it's very cool to have lots of kids. But um, culturally, you know, it's still, if you're, if you're just kind of a middle-class person or a working-class person or, you know, a couple of working parents or whatever, it's still seen as kind of unseemly to have more than two kids. Mm -hmm. And if you buy into that or you let that make your decision for you, you know, there's a lot of pressure on you um, to do like the, the right thing by having your two point. Right. Yeah. I think environment does make a big difference. Even if you don't think you're, uh, you know, succumbing to peer pressure, what's around you is sort of what becomes, like your, you know, normal, you know, your yeah. gauge of what's, what's normal or average. And you feel weird for going outside of that, but just right. buck the trend, man. If you want right. to do it, buck the right. trend. I mean, or start your totally. own trend. Totally. <laughs> um, well the, and the, the third thing that you kind of wrapped up this beyond baby chapter with was we just talked about a few minutes ago and I love, which is that sometimes ambivalence is okay that you don't, that there isn't for everyone a moment where you're like, I'm definitely done. Um, yep. and I think, I think a lot of people, if they waited for that moment, they would just keep waiting. Like you're, like you're yes. saying, and you had to come to a logical place where you realized that the, the feeling of not wanting babies was never going to happen, but that didn't mean you were done so that they are right. not, you, you, does that make sense? So yeah. I thought that was a really, um, great point. There's also, I'm not going to read these here, but there's some great kind of, um, journaling prompts that will, if we give this chapter, if we'll link to it in the show notes, um, for people who really do want to kind of work through those. And you just have some great questions, like really thought provoking questions to ask yourself about, you know, what does the future look like for you with this family? And, um, so I think that for those who are really kind of in that on the fence place, that will be a great, resource. Um, so I oh. thought for the last few minutes, I thought maybe we could talk about what, now that you're done and I'm done, and we're both done having babies. What are some things you love about being in that beyond baby phase or that have been, have been the upside to that sadness of saying goodbye to the baby stage? Yeah. Cause I think there's, I think we can leave on a positive note. I know Absolutely. I'm just really starting to see, like really starting to see those positives, but you've written a lot about that. Well, I mean, for one thing, and I'm in the, obviously in a different stage than you are. I'm several years down the road for you. I mean, more mm-hmm. than that because I've got teenagers. Um, gosh, we can just go. We can just go out. Mm-hmm. It's fantastic. We don't have to worry about babysitters anymore. Um, we have built-in babysitters, and our teenage sons are very happy to babysit. They've, they, you know, we've talked about this in a previous episode. But my kids all really like each other, and they don't really see it as a burden. Um, partly because they don't have to do anything. That's, mm-hmm. you know, my youngest is six. So just make sure she they're not changing has food diapers. Yeah. if she needs it. Um, yeah, they're not changing diapers. They're not having to worry about naps or any of that kind of stuff. Um, so the ease of being able to do stuff, the ease of being able to get other people to take over for a night so we can mm-hmm. go out of town. It's really easy now. It's, it's not even called babysitting anymore. It's called arranging a sleepover. Right. Um, right. So that kind of stuff has been so freeing because for so long we didn't have any yeah. freedom um, yeah. and, and independence. and. That has been like kind of a little, it's been, we kind of were a little drunk on it for a while. Just yeah. like, oh, the freedom, we can do anything we want. I remember the first time I left my son in charge when he was like 13 and I, maybe 14, Claire was finally old enough where I felt like I could just leave. 
And I went to the store by myself and I was walking through the grocery store and I thought, I never, if I don't want to, I never have to take a kid to the store with me again. (laughs) It's like, what? So, um, that kind of thing. And it all sounds like, sounds like a little, I guess, frivolous and selfish, but it it is, it is totally frivolous and selfish and I love it. And you've earned it. And I've earned it. Um, and I think now, you know, we're looking forward to a different phase of our lives now. Um, I keep joking with people about, you know, retirement, which is still a long ways off for us, except we're both self-employed. So I think we'll probably have some kind of different sort of transition into mm-hmm. retirement. For us, retirement is just where we end up living, not right. our work status. Right. Um, our kids are going to be all out of the house in like 12 years mm-hmm. or it could be, you know, Claire will be an mm-hmm. adult in 12 years. And in, and in six years, our household is going to look completely different. Right. We're going to be down to two kids and or three kids and then two mm-hmm. within seven years. Mm-hmm. So we're now looking, we're at that phase now where it's like, what are the long term mm-hmm. decisions we're going to be making? Like when we um, were currently renting and we were thinking about buying and I was like, why would we buy? There's no reason for us to buy a house right now because in such a short period of time, we won't want that house anymore. Yes. <laughs> we won't want a five bedroom house anymore. You know, we'll, we'll be looking at something completely different. So let's just kind of keep it loose and easy and then maybe we'll move and we, we feel like we could just do whatever we want in a way it's kind of we're getting to that stage now of life and of parenting we're really looking forward to what well the and second i think half is that that like. ability to see long term is something you completely lose when you have small children and babies yeah you can't because you, you're thinking day to day you're you know day to day you don't have time or like have not gotten enough sleep the night before to think right. past the next four hours but if there's another potential baby on the horizon, it also throws so much uncertainty. I mean, I remember that thinking, like trying to plan a vacation and thinking, maybe I'll be pregnant. Like maybe I'll right. be nursing. Maybe I'll have a newborn, you know? And so once you yeah. feel complete about kids, you're still head down in the trenches for a few years. But once you know there's nobody else arriving, like the train is right. not Right, no other humans to consider. You can picture, I, I find this like so much different is I can picture what we will look like as a family in five, 10, 15 years, like you're saying, yeah. whereas you really can't picture that if you're not done having babies, cause you don't know who else is going to be here. Not that you can't right. do long-term planning, but it, there's, there's a big shift. I think, you know, that happens that the ability to think long-term and there's two parts of it. One is you just don't know, you know, what other babies are arising. And then two, you're so in the moment that it is very hard to look past the next day or week or month or whatever. So I, I completely agree with that. It's, it becomes fun to think about, you know, where will we be? The other thing I think, or that I've started to enjoy is like the idea that we can do things as a family and all enjoy the same things. You know, I think before that like enjoyment and pastimes was a sort of fractured thing. You're either doing something for the kids, like taking them to a playground or you're getting a babysitter so that you guys can go do something that's enjoyable to you. And of course those things will still happen, but there there's this phenomenon of being able to do something as a family that's enjoyable for everybody in the family. That to me is like a kind of a wake up, like, Oh, like this is like fun to hang out with the five of us. You know what I mean? And you're going to get there even more. I mean, you know, where Violet is right now, you're still sort of at the phase where if you go on a family vacation, it's all about making Allegra and Reed happy and, Keeping and just and doing she's along something for the, yeah. with Violet, yes. <laughs> like just yes. keeping her under control. Yes. And you know, in the next like year, you're yeah. gonna have you're gonna be able to go on vacations that yeah. all the kids will enjoy. Like yeah. everyone will enjoy wherever you go, and they'll they'll all remember it. Yes, that's also it's not just about arranging nap times and making right. sure you're close to um you know someplace you can change a diaper if you yeah. have to or feed a baby if you have to. It becomes about like a family unit, and that's right. I think so much about the shift that, you know, the blog went through, um, mm-hmm. for anybody who's not a long term, long time blog reader from the happiest home, it used to be called the happiest mom. And I really, around the time Clara was about three, mm-hmm. two, two and a half, three, I started thinking about changing the focus from motherhood to family life because mm-hmm. it became less about me mothering mm-hmm. this child, you know, the latest baby or whatever. And it became more about our life as a family unit. And that's yep. really fun. It's a really fun it's place really to be. really fun. And I, like you said, I'm just barely, I'm, I'm not even really there yet, but I'm so close to being able to you're, see that close, as possible. Yeah. I know. I'm. We're like <laughs> not not many months away from no diapers and then no naps. And I feel like right. when you drop diapers and drop the necessary nap, that's really like, well, to me at least, it seems like a magical place. You know, yeah. just next, next episode, we're going to talk about camping. And I'm like, camping will be so 
awesome when there's no diapers and no naps, you know, it's like, like things like that just become possible. So I think it's a good thing. Um, I think we need to wrap up, but, um, I love the idea of sharing this chapter of beyond baby in the show notes at the momhour.com and then letting people know, um, where they can get the beyond baby book, which you wrote, it's been over a year now. It was, I think May of last year. And it is such a great, resource for people who maybe are done or nearly done with the baby years and aren't quite sure. The tagline is creating a life you love when your kids aren't so little. So, you know, aren't quite sure what's next or how to be purposeful about designing that life once you've looked up from the trenches. So it's such, it's so great. I can say that. Thank you. It is, it was a lot of fun to write and, um, yeah, I, I was really proud of it. So Definitely get your free chapter. Speaking of ebooks, if you somehow managed to miss episode six of the Mom Hour, you're going to want to go listen to it because we're giving away a free ebook in that, and you have to listen to get it. So (laughs) yes, you do. Um, But thank you to everyone who has been listening and emailing us. Emailing us, us, and yeah, please continue. Emails are rolling in. in. We love hearing from you. Hello at themomhour.com, or we're on Twitter at themomhour, and all the show notes are just all you have to do is go to themomhour.com, and you'll see all of our episodes. You can leave a comment um, on individual shows there, and we respond there too. So lots of ways to continue the conversation. We are now. doing shows weekly so we'll yes. be back in a week kind of unofficially week we just kind of snuck yeah it we just sort of decided did you notice so. <laughs> feed more yep. often it's exciting so we'll be back next week and we'll be talking about camping been fun as always sarah thanks megan the mom hour is brought to you by partners like chatbooks Chatbooks makes it beyond easy to create beautiful photo books by importing your digital photos from anywhere, Instagram, Facebook, Google Photos, or directly from your phone. The books come in a variety of sizes with beautiful cover options and binding styles to choose from, and they start at just $15. Plus, we have a great deal just for our listeners. Use code THEMOMHOUR20 to save 20% off your purchase. Just download the Chatbooks app and use code THEMOMHOUR20 to save 20%. Hi friends, Megan here. I wanted to let you know about a new podcast I've just launched called The Teas Made. Think of it as a weekly cozy conversation with me over your favorite hot beverage on topics like wellness, creativity, family, hospitality, and more. Just look for The Teas Made with Megan Francis wherever you get your podcasts or head to theteasmade.com to find all those episodes. The Teas Made is your reminder to take a little break from the busyness of life. So come on in and get comfy. The Teas Made.